testing. Where's home for you? Uh, I, I live in Carmel. Okay. Oh, okay. Kind of everywhere. Cisco is in Los Angeles. Doing a project down there actually. Um, the New Seasons Grocery Anchor Development, right across from Pack Trust, the Safeway Center down there, right at the mouth. Rear Ranch, right there. Oh, yeah, sure. Still subject to an EIR and a couple of things, but. No, I've seen your sign. Yeah. Yeah. It's a nice little project. How are you doing? Great community down there. I mean, it's just. Uh, Hi, Jim. James. 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 Yeah. Pleased to meet you. Yeah, nice.
Uh, tonight's uh, panel is a presentation on placemaking with retail. And uh, very fortunate to have uh, three panelists, our moderator. Now, one of our, you, if you count, you'll see that there's two panelists right now and a moderator. Um, our third panelist is en route and should be here shortly. Uh, introducing from um, my far left, James Chung. He is the Executive Managing Director um, with Cushman Wakefield. And he has uh, been with the company for 14 years. Uh, currently represents more than 30 national tenants most of these Fortune 500 and over 7 million square feet uh, retail across nine Bay Area counties. Uh, includes businesses like Sur La Tab, 24 Hour Fitness, Mod Pizza, um, that we've all heard of. And uh, interestingly, he was one of uh, the Silicon Valley Business Journal's top 40 under 40 a couple years ago. And now I'll go ahead and introduce the rest. Um, Steven, Steve Eimer is here with us. He's the Executive Vice President at Related Urban. Uh, since joining Related in 2007, he has served as a pro project executive for City Center of City North, a 78-acre mixed-use uh, project in Arizona. He's also project uh, executive for Grand Avenue Project, a high-rise urban master plan development in downtown Los Angeles. And he is currently the company's managing partner for the Related Santa Clara Project, which is a a 9.2 million square foot development in Santa Clara. Um, other milestone projects uh, Mr. Eimer has worked on include the development of the architecturally acclaimed Fox Plaza in Los Angeles, the uh, development of the inn, links, and residences at Spanish Bay and Pebble Beach, the renovation of the lodge at Pebble Beach, and uh, the development of the 450 million mixed use portion of Copley Place in Boston, if you've been out there. And, and then our third panelist, who's not here at the moment, um, but will be joining us uh, shortly, I trust, is uh, Dee Hunter. He is the president of Hunter Properties and the managing member of Hunter Storm LLC. Um, Hunter Properties is a 55-year-old real estate development and property management company, currently with 30 different assets, totaling 5 million square feet. Uh, the family-oriented company has developed well in excess of 8 million square feet during its history. Uh, Mr. Hunter is involved with all new project developments, property management, leasing, and oversight of uh, Bay Area self-storage. And he joined the company in 1982 after working for Caldwell Banker in San Francisco. Also uh, joining us tonight is a moderator, um, Edith Ramirez. She is the um, Director of Economic Development, or Economic Development Director, I believe, for the uh, City of Morgan Hill. And so she has a lot of experience with the issue of retail and, and bringing in uh, retail as part of a development strategy. And here is uh, Dee Hunter joining us. Dramatic entrance, <laughs> just in time. So with that, um, James is going to be our first presenter. We're, we're going to have um, each of the panelists will give a, sort of a 10 minute or so presentation, and then we'll do some uh, moderated question and answer time, and then we'll have a time for an uh, audience uh, question and answer as well. So with that. Fantastic. Well, I've been bestowed the honor of starting the program, so thank you for having me. Um, as Andrew mentioned, I'm the Executive Managing Director at Cushman and Wakefield. I also run the Western United States for the retail platform from Texas to California, which gives me a unique perspective because I get to live sometimes at 30,000 feet and see what the difference is of a town like Santa Clara versus a city like Denver, Denver or a city like Seattle or Dallas. And what I always find is that I'm grateful to live where we do. And for many of the reasons we're about to talk about, but fundamentally retailers and developers, we are constantly looking um, at various analytics and metrics uh, in the world that we live in. And some of these I'm gonna show you right now, um, but as the world changes, so does the retail and the complexion of retail. Uh, so with that, um, I wanted to include some economic indicators that we'd like to monitor um, as the world goes around. And the first one is, as you can see, uh, comparatively, our unemployment in the Bay Area is incredibly low uh, compared to the other ma major metros around the country. And you might wonder, well, why would a retailer care how many people are working here or, or more importantly, not working here? Um, and all of this adds into this equation and formula that uh, as objective as it looks, it's also very subjective. But again, this is something that we monitor just to understand the health of the economy, who's spending money and where. Um, this is a 
really interesting slide because as you can see, this is Santa Clara County. There have been over a quarter million jobs added to the county since 2009. In fact, we've exceeded 75,000 above the actual peak level, uh, which was in the Q4 of 1999, and that was uh, over 944,000 people employed. And typically, the number of employed personnel or bodies in the market is always referenced as daytime population. And in Santa Clara in particular, uh, it is a, a very healthy daytime population. And a lot of that daytime population is really referenced in the form of how a lot of these restaurants and quick service restaurants in particular uh, can understand and forecast the type of volumes that they're gonna do. And so there are minimum numbers of daytime pop that people need to have and Santa Clara definitely checks those boxes. Um, the next segment of the presentation, I wanted to talk a little bit about market drivers. Um, this is an interesting slide because I think we've all have seen before our eyes this evolution of the live, work, play, shop, eat um, type of environments that a lot of uh, people are trying to create and create, and again, placemaking. Um, and what this slide shows you is the call it the evolution of Caltrain and really public trans altogether and, and really the perception in general with public transportation. Because 20 years ago, we never really thought twice about it, particularly in the South Bay, maybe more East Bay, obviously San Francisco proper, it's uh, more prominent. But now in the South Bay, Caltrain, as you can see, even year over year from 2014 to 2015, it went up over 9%, um, which is substantial. And what we're finding is a lot of the retail and also actually candidly offices are trying to position themselves to have accessibility to these public transportation lines. Um, this next slide, just another quick stat, talking about residential density as we referenced the daytime density previously. Uh, this shows you the single family, multifamily residential starts uh, in comparison to net job gains from 2011 to 2016. And you'll see there's a very there's a high inverse relationship, except for uh, 2016, 2016, excuse me, in particular, um, but showing you uh, the demand on the housing in this area, as we've seen with the uh, call it influx of high density residential into the community. This next quadrant of the presentation, and again, I'm moving fast because we were supposed to include this information within 10 minutes, and so I'm obviously open to have, answer any questions later. Uh, but really quickly, just from a retail shopping center overview, wanted to give you a quick snapshot of not only the overall market, but also the sub markets. And really because of, again, all the things we just talked about, um, all, these, these are all relatively low, low numbers, particularly uh, when you compare it to the rest of the world and uh, the rest of the country. And again, because fundamentally we're so strong, and I always like to believe, uh, you know, when we go through these business cycles, we're the last to fail and first to recover. And part of that reason is because, again, we have great daytime, daytime pop, incredibly high residential densities, obviously uh, people who make a lot of money, a lot of disposable income, and so on and so forth. Again, going along with the last slide, uh, this is a really macro 30,000 foot snapshot at the uh, total shopping center inventory, which is you know, a little over 37 million feet in, in Silicon Valley. Um, those rents are on an annual basis and they're all triple net. And what that means is triple net are in addition to this per square foot number. And the only reason why this does not accurately reflect um, when you get to a, to the ground levels, because $29 in reference to a call it a class A shopping center is really more about a bigger box. And when I say that, I mean something typically over 10,000 square feet. Um, and, you know, cause we're seeing rents even at places like call it Santana row, that could be $90, $100 a square foot triple net. Uh, but really again, just to show you a snapshot of, of where the world has been and potentially where it's going. Uh, this one in particular is for Santa Clara which has, again, a little over 2.7 million feet, but as you can see, the total vacancy is really low at 5.3. Now, comparatively, if you were to say, well, James, what's the lowest vacancy rate in the Bay Area? And that's actually San Francisco proper, which is a completely different profile, as you know, with not only the residential density, but also even the, the complexion of the retail there. So, as we 
dive into placemaking uh, in this particular community, we wanted to also give you some examples where uh, not only is being created, but also where there's been some success. So the first example I think that everybody knows is really probably the most iconic open air lifestyle center in Northern California and has been since it came out of the ground. And this is the uh, Santana Row where actually we office um, and that's, that was owned and also developed by Federal Realty. Now you may ask, well James, what makes this so special? Why has this had the success that it's had? Now, I would argue that it's the geography because we all know what was there before. It was an old town and country style shopping center, completely disjointed uh, with really very little energy. I remember, I think there was a theater there at the time. Um, I grew up in the South Bay, so I'm trying to recollect between that and El Paseo, right? We both had similar profiles. Um, why is it, what made this so exciting? Well, what this, what the genesis of this project really was bringing luxury to Silicon Valley. Now, believe it or not, despite how beautiful it is today, they've really pivoted away from luxury. And you can see by the profile of, of the customer, or I'm sorry, excuse me, the merchants that have come into the shopping center, not the Gucci and the Teslas, but you know, the Amazon books that was just signed H&M. I mean, those are value plays, but really if you break it down, what it is, this is incredibly food centric. And this is really a strong indicator of where the world is going. Um, if you look at the restaurants, in fact, three of the restaurants are owned by, or actually four, excuse me, are owned by one guy. And they partnered with him early on as he's been able to really, really take off and spread his wings and grow and thrive. And, and those restaurants are Sino. Um, well, Sino, it's, um, um, I work there, I can't even believe I can tell you. Roots and Rye, it's um, not Left Bank. Oh, was that? Uh, no, that's different. Anyway, my point is, excuse me for that, <laughs> but the point is, his name's Chris Lynn, and he's uh, he's he has four restaurants at the at the shopping center. But uh, long story short, uh, beyond that, though, what they were able to do was achieve for the first time, very successfully, out of San Francisco proper, a truly mixed vertical mixed use shopping center. And everybody around the Bay Area, as they build and build and build, keep referencing Santana Row. Well, we want Santana Row. We want Santana Row. At the end of the day, it's a very unique project for a lot of the reasons we'll get into later, but um, you know, I think we've all spent time there and, and feel an energy that we might not be able to identify, but it to this day continues to thrive. And I will tell you that Federal Realty t um, has told me personally that this is, out of all their assets around the country, the most difficult to lease because they have to be so incredibly careful of how they merchandise the shopping center. And um, again, for all the reasons that we've started to discuss. This is another quick snapshot but of a totally different shopping center in Palo Alto that is uh, geographically, was geographically born at, you know, one of the best intersections in the Bay Area. You have Stanford University, huge daytime pop like we talked about earlier with Page Mill, Sand Hill Road, um, and then an incredible merchandising mix from not only apparel tenants, great restaurants, um, you could almost call it a daily, daily needs of Trader Joe's, uh, but really a great example of how the town actually made it, it made it, it was their purpose to keep the town and country energy and complexion, which everybody else was going away from, but it was a mandate from the city for them to keep it like that, which is why it looks like that today. Now, would it be more, even stronger or better uh, if it were torn down and rebuilt? Who knows? But the point is, is that they've done a great job of, again, balancing the merchandising mix um, with some very cool, you know, contemporary tenants. And but they continue to change and evolve with time. They just repositioned that whole. If you're looking at building one on the left side, that was a Scott's Seafood um, where you see Prana there. And so they're really mindful of making sure this uh, stays uh, again, in a contemporary fashion. Now this one, bringing it back closer to home with Santa Clara Square, uh, we all, all are very familiar with Irvine Company, what they do, how they do it. And uh, they've been able to call it place make uh, uh, this project with, again, 120,000 feet of retail. Um, really the anchor tenant, as we reference it in, in retail, uh, is Whole Foods. And this is a full scale Whole Foods, not a their discount 365 brand. Um, and they're absolutely killing it. 
there's still a phase two of the, pro of the project that's going to happen. And you can see it's across the street with OPA and across from Sir Latab there. But I think the what's been great about uh, this project is a couple of things. One is it's a very underserved trade area. And so there wasn't enough retail supporting it. And tons and tons of daytime pop, again, going back to all the employees in the area. And then two, they've also layered in um, some future uh, not only future office, but also future residential. But one thing to remember that the retail is, doesn't survive with just people living near around the property or even above the property. Um, I mean, they, they're looking off into a one, three, five, ten, 10, or even for some larger projects, 20 mile radiuses to really capture that customer base. Uh, and this one was is an interesting project to bring to your attention because it's it's under construction in the city of San Ramon. Uh, this is going to be you know 111,000 feet of retail, 56,000 of it's going to be restaurant space, and again, really an indicator of where this world's going to at food and beverage, F and B, uh, and experiential retail, uh, including entertainment. So they signed a deal with a concept called the Loft out of San Diego which you can actually go spend the entire day at. They serve coffee in the morning. When lunch comes around, the menu changes, the, the energy changes, and, and so on and so forth throughout the day. Uh, but the point being is that this is going to be very, again, food and entertainment centric, but then also uh, layering in apparel and other traditional retail. Uh, but what's great about this is that the, the, the position of the shopping center is totally 100% deliberate. Uh, it's in the right in the heart of San Ramon, directly adjacent to huge office parks. You look around on an aerial, all rooftops around. It's going to pull from Dublin Pleasant all the way up to Wanner Creek, and so there's um, a lot of uh, expect high expectations for this one. And that would be the end of my presentation. Who wants to go next? <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. I'm Steve Eimer with Related Companies, uh, co-managing partner of our Santa Clara project, where um, we are a partner in that project with the city of Santa Clara. They own the land, and we're bringing capital and some expertise to the equation to uh, try to make this happen uh, for the benefit of everybody here in the valley. Um, it's quite a significant project. Uh, it's a total of 9.2 million square feet, for those of you who may not be familiar with it. And I'll take you quickly through the program, but I, I thought with the short time that we've got, because I can talk about this as Lisa and our council members know for hours and hours and hours, uh, but I thought I'd just kind of walk you through, oh, I have to do this? Uh, no, it's okay. What's that? I'm going to get to that in about two seconds. Uh, I thought what I'd do as I walk through this is to uh, just point out to you, you know, some of the key elements that we think are important in placemaking. Uh, we've done a lot of it over the years with many, many different projects and been quite successful. It remains to be seen if we'll be that successful here. We're quite confident. Uh, so uh, this is a, a quick uh, overview of the project. Uh, it is located directly across from Levi Stadium on Tasman, uh, bounded on the east by the Guadalupe River, on the north roughly by the 237, and on the west by Great America Parkway. So it's a total of 239 acres, currently the Santa Clara Golf Course for the most part. Uh, and on that, we have entitled 9.2 million square feet of development that will be done in phases over many, many years. I hope to live to see the end of it. Um, and uh, of that 9.2 million, the largest component of square footage is 5.4 million square feet of office space, which will primarily be in corporate office campuses on the periphery of what we call the city center. Uh, and the heart of what we're doing is what we call the city center, and that, that's where all the placemaking happens. Uh, so in the city center, which is that multicolored area just north of Tasman, just north of the stadium, it, it consists of about uh, 45 acres of the total acreage. Uh, we'll do about 1.1 million square feet of uh, retail, uh, 
1,680 residential units, which we're just about to get uh, underway with the mayor's help um, through the water board. Uh, it'll be the first uh, residential uh, approved in the state of California to be built on a landfill. So it's, it's quite an accomplishment. Um, and then we'll do uh, 700 uh, hotel rooms in two different facilities. 250,000 square feet of food and beverage and 190,000 square feet of, of entertainment. One of the really key planning concepts for us is this districting concept. And we're focused in this plan just on the city center piece. So this is again about the 45 or 50 acres of our city center. And we, 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 it doesn't, it doesn't work to do large, monolithic, sort of uh, traditional shopping centers anymore. Gonzo. Right, James? They are uh, dead meat. Now, there are some in the, in the area that do pretty well. Stanford is an example. Valley Fair, obviously. And, and they're great, and they're run by terrific companies, and they do a very good job. But uh, we think that the open air lower scale, human scale, pedestrian oriented environment is really what the consumer wants today. And that's a key aspect for us of placemaking today. It's not enclosed malls. It's not big regional shopping centers. It's more of a neighborhood feel. So what we've done, we have a very large project, but what we've done is broken it down into a series of districts. So you can see them enumerated there. Uh, Gateway District, Station, Boulevard, they each have different types of uses. And I'm going to walk you quickly through uh, what those are. So the Gateway District would be just across from Levi Stadium uh, on Tasman. And it will be the first phase of what we uh, develop. And it will consist of a hotel, office building, and some residential units. Um, and it, it's going to have, I think, a, a very exciting, this is a view from street level looking right across from Levi Stadium at the entrance at Centennial on the left-hand side. And then the next one is on the right-hand side of Centennial. Um, we have some, I think, very exciting concepts for retail, food and beverage uh, that will uh, establish that portal, that entryway. Uh, and then on the one side will be office above the retail, and on the other will be a hotel above retail. Um, the next district is a, uh, the station district, uh, extremely uh, important because it focuses on most of the entertainment venues. And, you know, when we talk about retail, um, I, I want to remind you that retail is not just retail. Okay, today, retail is uh, quite a mixture. It involves retail, retail entertainment, retail food and beverage, food and beverage, uh, personal services that become morph into a retail environment uh, is on and on. It's quite broad. So the traditional retail shop is uh, is kind of going out the door, and you've got to be very flexible uh, in what what a retail concept really is, and open the door to new uh, venues and new merchants. Uh, so. In the station district, uh, as you can see some of the images, uh, we're really looking at a very lively pedestrian-oriented uh, environment, two and three level retail, food and beverage, entertainment on top. Uh, this isn't something you can do everywhere, <laughs> okay, for obvious reasons. But because of the scale of what we're doing, we know we can make it work. Uh, one other thing I would really point out as a key planning aspect is parking. Uh, in our scheme, I should have pointed it out in an earlier slide. Uh, I can talk about it more later if you want. But we've taken parking to the periphery of our city center. It's not in the center. It's, it's the center of our city center is going to be predominantly pedestrian oriented. Uh, because we think that it's not that the car's bad. 
it's not that having some parking and some street flow in the city center, that can work. In Santana Row it works, but we want to move the parking garages to the, to the periphery. And we're also very mindful that the world of parking is going to be changing dramatically over the next 5 to 15, 20 years. Uh, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to hopefully reduce the reliance on the automobile in a lot of different ways. And it's going to bring into the equation the use of all kinds of different vehicles and systems uh, for, uh, you know, uh, moving about. We, we also benefit in our project greatly by being on the Tasman light rail line for VTA and also on the commuter rail line along Lafayette where we'll have a station two stations really, one on the light rail, one on the commuter rail, and so we're very much plugged into the idea of public transit uh, as access. But again, parking is going to change a lot uh, in the coming years, and we, we don't have it all figured out. Maybe Deke does, he maybe t t talk to this, but it is in our industry, it's an interesting conundrum as to how you don't want to overbuild for it because you may not need it five years from now, right? Anyway, uh, this is a view of the station area at street level. Um, and this, the next uh, area, next district is called the Boulevard, which is kind of our high street shopping district. It will be anchored by a number of different types of merchants on either end. And then um, along the boulevard, it will be very pedestrian oriented. In the center of the boulevard, we hope to have cafes and restaurants um, and a tremendous interaction at the pedestrian level. And then above it, uh, above the retail food and beverage entertainment would be uh, office and residential uh, uses. Somewhat similar to what you see at uh, Santana Row. Uh, we also will include a hotel in right in the heart of the city center. Uh, we uh, related owns the Equinox brand, which is a health club, but we're morphing that into a hotel brand now, and it's very exciting. Uh, it appeals to younger, healthier people, uh, right? But it uh, will do a tremendous, uh, very exciting hotel with street level again, street level retail and food and beverage at the base because the key to placemaking is is really having the right mix of merchants at street level that attract the type of customers that provide energy as much as you can get um, and a hotel provides some of that residential above retail provides some of it and also office above retail provide. So mixed use, it, we're just completely sold on that, you know, going forward. And then we'll also have a, a loft type office, live work district, again, shops and food and beverage on the lower level, but loft type office above that. And then uh, the last district that I'll mention in, um, is what we call our design district, uh, which is at the northern end of the city center. And um, we're going to, we're working with one of the world's leading um, home furnishings uh, entities to establish a, a, a pretty unique concept there um, where they will showcase their, their goods and their design capabilities and will incorporate residential. Uh, as you can see in this slide, uh, residential is above design, home furnishing and design oriented shops and stores. And uh, so that, uh, that's going to be a pretty unique concept and again provide 24-7 life to the, to the village, to the, to the city center. Okay, is that right? Oh, you want to? Yeah, good. Sorry. Yeah. Great. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. And um, I apologize that I was late. Um, sure enough, when Andrew called up and said Santa Clara is having a, 
little symposium and we would like you to come talk about one of your projects. I say, great. And at the same time, the University of Santa Clara called up and said, we're having a symposium. Would you sit on this panel? And my assistant went, well, we've already talked to your office. Yeah, we, we said, great, we'll be there. <laughs> Only to find out the university and the city of Santa Clara both had public events tonight oriented towards retail. So uh, that's why I was late. Um, so thank you for including me. And um, maybe I can kind of uh, add in here a little bit. Um, my name is Dee Hunter. I've worked here in the Valley now, um, heck, 30 plus years, 34 years. And um, our company has been here about 60 years. We've done projects in Santa Clara and all throughout really the mid peninsula of San Mateo and Santa Clara County. Our retail projects um, have been of every shape and size from street retail in downtown um, Los Gatos to the first power center in Santa Clara County, which was out in Milpitas to <clears throat> the recent Bass Pro down in Almond in 85. <clears throat> and then also this project that I brought tonight. <clears throat> this project is, um, well, it formerly was called uh, Sunnyvale Town Center. Uh, we now call it City Line. And this is actually a, a really good place to, to stop and, and kind of help raise some questions, you know, for the community. If you think about it, Sunnyvale Town Center, a lot of us lived here when it was up and going as a mall 20, 30 years ago. Think about it, Valco was up and running as a mall 20, 30 years ago. And what we've seen in front of us, and of course we live on the on the internet and we see how the internet's changing the face of retail. Retail is changing a lot even before all the hoopla and, and all the, you know, very accurately, all the, the attention that's coming with the internet. Retail is, is a growing, it's a live uh, business. And it, it's what makes things um, exciting about it. It's what at the very sort of beginning level of community planning, we tend to migrate towards retail as a way to drive community. But there's not one set answer, you know, from the example James gave you to the example of City Place out in, you know, in Santa Clara. It can come at a lot of different scales and a lot of different characters. And so one size doesn't fit all. When you see your vacancy numbers in Santa Clara, um, I wouldn't, as a developer, I wouldn't look at that and go, that's great. I wouldn't look at that and say it's terrible. I actually would tell you, you've actually really have scaled your retail quite fittingly for what you need. You have a, an appropriate vacancy rate. That means you have new tenants can come and go. Tenants that aren't doing well, don't deserve to stay. Tenants that like to come here, have a place to go. So um, in retail, one of the worst things you can do is have dark storefronts. Because if you think about a sense of community, no one likes to walk down a street that's checkered with both you know stores that are open and stores that are closed. So with all that bluster, so I went out and bought a really large vacant shopping center. <laughs> and um, so Sunnyvale Town Center, as you see it, um, has actually gone into bankruptcy three times over 20 plus years. And it was a mall, it was partially a mall. Unfortunately, it was a large street scene development uh, that was started in uh, 2007. It uh, contemplated over a million square feet of retail. And because of a variety of factors, changes in shopping patterns, different opportunities for the community to shop, being pulled down to town and country, or, or in, used to stay with James's example, up to Santana Row, these centers cannot flex as quickly. And when you build these environments, you own that built environment. Um, and this is an example of where capital and a built environment didn't line up. And again, Sunnyvale Town Center went uh, into receivership. So we've recently acquired this project. So now I have the benefit of, you know, we consider ourselves farmers and that we, we bring things out of the ground versus vultures, which is typically somebody who flies over and picks up the uh, leftover pieces. This is more of a, of, a, of a vulture thing than a farmer thing. But it really is, it's a starting over thing is what this is. And so from a community, how we step back, we look at this project and realize that this shopping center is for the Sunnyvale residents and, and for that matter, the, you know, the, the neighboring communities around it. But what I'm really focused on here from my standpoint is to take care of the three miles around me. And why did I pick three miles? 
because in round numbers, it's six miles up to Valley Fair, and it's six miles down to Stanford. I think my mother would correct me, you're not supposed to say up and down. It's six miles north to Stanford, and it's six miles uh, south down to Valley Fair. So very simply, we split that trade area, and we start to look at the 240,000 Sunnyvale residents that have never had a downtown that want to call a place home. Not a place that has to be Santana Row, not a place as, as spectacular as what the related companies will do, and they will build a, a spectacular project and their reputation supports it. But a project that really is, you know, the town cliche is it's the medium bear. It's, it's the one that fits just right. So how do you make something fit just right? What I'm going to tell you doesn't mean it's just right. I'm just telling you the thought process that we're going through for this. So what we do is we step back and we start to look at all the things in our community that starts to inform us. And whether it's a community center or an outdoor movie theater or indoor dining or fire pit. Just tonight, as I was running from the car, which was a really pretty look, I had to say, there were like four families out here on scooters looking at the fountains. That's really informative. There, that's people are coming even to the old civic you know center here, and this kind of informs their evening. And so for us, this informs where we start on a project of this scale. Okay, then we take it a little bit closer. So we go from that to some place where you can visit, work, and ride to really now what makes up this livable, walkable community. Clearly, if you're at three miles, you're going to get in your car and you're going to drive to city line. If you're at two miles, you might get on your bike, and if you're at one mile, you might walk. So now we, we start to zoom in a little bit closer and we look at categories. And Steve's 100% right. The retail that initially informed Sunnyvale Town Center or Valco, to use those examples, is not the retail that we have today. Food and entertainment, food and beverage and entertainment, public spaces, entertainment, you know, daily needs for us in this location really is what uh, drives this site. And this has then started the, for us part of the imagery that goes around it. What, what do you want to see when you walk into City Line or into your city center? And for us, it's, it's our friends, it's our neighbors, it's, it's, um, it's not that I'm not going to the mall to go buy a new pair of socks. I'm sure I can go to Target and buy a new pair of socks. What I want to do, because I probably bought those socks online, is I want to walk out there and see a pop-up restaurant I hadn't seen before. I want to stand around and talk about what's going on in the school district. I want to be informed by my neighbors on movies they've recently seen. So these are some of the images that we look to incorporate into our project. This is then another step, even a little bit more granular, in which we're getting very local. And our project, as we'll get to it, you'll see in the old project, wow, this is really a test for me, isn't it? I'm going the wrong way here, here we go. In this old project, uh, can you go to full screen again? Or um, Here we go. In the old project, you can see they had this park that's up in the middle where you see a couple redwood trees. And they built literally a horseshoe-shaped building around it. From our standpoint, where I can build, have large retailers and build a typical shopping center, which think of a, think of a barbell, right? Which Macy's is over here, and Forum is there, or today would be Safeway, and possibly Target at the other end. For us, we're really focusing our efforts around this park. So uh, the first thing we did when we bought this property was I demolished those buildings. Um, and so in demolishing those buildings, what it does for us then is it starts to open up the project. So for us, we are going to focus our energy right at that intersection. We're going to have a nucleus to this project that is focused around those groups I talked about, retail, entertainment, um, daily needs, and then talk about those activities that you want from that. And then we start to break it down. And this is a, a graphic that we used for why would you come to our project, whether you're driving three miles or walking one mile? Is it date night? Are you a local person? Are you going to the Whole Foods? Are you going to the theater? Is it a day tripper? We all know the population of our day trips around our projects, you know, with, with all the major tenants. You know, I have Apple and Nokia right on site and every other major, you know, 
tech tenant right in the area. And then we couldn't help but knock off the TV show uh, Silicon Valley. And if you look real close, those are all the characters of Silicon Valley. And what people want to do when they want to go out with their partner and hang out. And so for us, that starts to inform our tenant mix. And then this next slide is actually the built environment that I have, and then imposing onto that built environment what we see going on. So if you really look, that nucleus is the intersection of McKinley and Murphy. Murphy, for a lot of you, think of historic Murphy Street, you know, Dish Dash and some of those restaurants there. Um, McKinley takes me all the way up to Matilda in a historic way. I would probably normally build my shopping center up on the busiest street. I've actually gone to the intersection. To me, this project is all about kind of an arm that reaches me back into historic Murphy and that set of community that uh, appreciates that and then reaches west up to Matilda and has me this, this street scene in which we have residential over retail as well as we have office lining the Matilda street. So to Steve's comments, mixed use really is what we're doing. Mixed use is changing very quickly. It's changing as quickly as what the related company is proposing. I have a little bit of a harder trick here because I have a partially built environment. What I'll say about a partially built environment is gonna be the most obvious and semi-insulting thing someone could say. When it's built, it's done. And so and my whole point there is, there's a tendency to make decisions that are one, two, five years out. You're gonna have an opportunity to look at different densities and you should really embrace those densities because it's going to inform the activity, the tenant mix, the behavior of what that street scene is going to do. You know, uh, Santana Row is extremely successful given the office and the, and the residential above it. And they kind of compressed it all together. And us like Santana Row, we've isolated our parking away from the project and out to these different uh, blocks, blocks one, two, and predominantly uh, five and six. So the car still can come through, but this is not a car-centric project. And as I looked at my second phase in this project, I will push the office up, more office. I will push the residential up because that will create more affordable units, which makes housing more affordable versus mandating affordability, building units, create affordability by providing supply and office, in this case here, because we're five minutes away from the train station, providing a vibrant connection up and down the Caltrain line. So that is, um, and I threw one other slide on here, just to emphasize what an asset you have here in Santa Clara. So I'm using Sunnyvale as my example, but James put a couple other projects on. He put the incredible project up there in San Ramon. Look at their densities. Look at their incomes compared to what we have here in Santa Clara County. Broadway Point is the equivalent of Valley Fair for Walnut Creek. The assets that we have here and in the opportunity for a built environment scaled correctly will provide you an opportunity that every other community, San Ramon and Walnut Creek under this example, can only dream about. So um, think about what you want and how you want it to behave and then scale it accordingly. And it's easy for me to give you advice because it's not my project. Um, be mindful of, of the fact that this is an opportunity to deliver residential and retail right into the heart and to keep that part of the project besides uh, the retail vibrant. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow. That was amazing. I don't know about you, but um, a wealth of information. I want to begin by thanking this amazing panel that is here with us tonight. I mean, it's really remarkable, the lineup that we have here, the wealth of information, and they're spending their Thursday night with us. So thank you for taking the time. Thank you to the city of Santa Clara for doing this. And, and taking the time to learn and engage the community so we can all do this. I want to have fun tonight, so we're going to move on to questions and answers and hopefully get some questions from you. But my thought is, how, 
how can we learn from this amazing wealth of information that we have here, this amazing projects? There's a lot of science, as you can see, that goes on into making retail decisions. But they have it all masterminded with, with projects that have uh, all the housing and the office. But how do we take some of these basic practices and apply them to, say, El Camino? How do we apply them to other communities? We have some folks in the room that are thinking about how do I take this to my community and what can I tell my community about what I learned tonight? So we're gonna, that's the learning we're gonna do. We're gonna figure out how we get from this stuff to taking that home to our neighborhoods, to our streets, and to our cities. So with that, you talked already a lot about the questions that we were going to talk about today. What is the importance of retail and placemaking? You talked about that quite a bit and, and the internet. Let's move on into the city. So cities, uh, we have, um, talking from a person that works for a city, we, we do this long-term planning and we want to get it right and we plan for the long run and we need to have policies and rules and regulations in place and we try to get it right. Right, but retail is so dynamic and ever changing. So let's talk a little bit about the policies and the role of the city in trying to get place making right. When does it work? What are the, how can the city be instrumental in make in making and guiding the right decision making? And what are the pitfalls of being rigid? Because that's what we do. We set policies and regulations. So let's let's get that with who wants to start first. <laughs> you have a um, mic. I think it's a very slippery slope when it comes to retail, specifically to, um, to make broad decisions um, without necessarily grounding them into all the basic axioms that still support these projects. So these projects, the size of these projects are scaled not just because of you know, the geography or you know, how much you know, area we have. We are looking at demand. We're looking at those population bases. We're looking at retail that's in place, existing demand centers that currently exist. We're looking at the <clears throat> reconfiguration of retail. Right now, less, more than more. But um, you know, in the related case, you know, a company like Macy's, which would, you know, will less than likely be operating here in two years, but more than likely might end up in Santa Clara. So I think it's, it's, it's wrong for the cities to impose um, large amounts of retail that divorce themselves from the actual mechanics of the business. I, I think that's right, Deke. I think you know, we're, we're living in, as it relates to retail, you know, we're living in a uh, very interesting times right now. Um, you know, James can, can comment on it. We're involved in projects all over the world. Um, Middle East, London, uh, New York, Florida, Chicago, several projects out west. And the one thing that's constant is that the retail world is changing dramatically and rapidly. Um, and so what am, I, what am I really talking about? And, and the internet is part of it, you know, online shopping and quick delivery and return policies are part of it, but that's just scratching, it's the tip of the iceberg. Um, I think, you know, maybe, we have collectively failed our consumer base, you know, and, and I don't really blame us for it. Bricks and mortar are hard to move. <laughs> They're hard to move around. Uh, but I think we maybe haven't done a very good job of anticipating the change in taste, the change in consumer habits, the change in consumer desires. And you, 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 you have to be, you have to, as a city, I think as policymakers, you have to try to create environments that entice quality developers to want to play the game and to participate with you in in placemaking. Um, and you can't make it so rigid that, that you're putting them in a box. 
Because I, I just don't think that's going to work very well, particularly in today's environment where the retail world is changing so dramatically from what we've known for a long time in every way. You know, it's been traditional. I'll just say one other thing and I'll quit. But it's been traditional that you finance retail centers, you know, based on anchor tenants that will sign significant leases over a long period of time. Let's say a 10-year deal, 20-year deal, that anchors your product, whatever, whatever it might be. What we're finding in, in the retail world is that, you know, retailers come and go very quickly. You know, who, who, you know, who who's going to be the hot new retailer two years from now? I don't know. Uh, who's going to be five years from now? God, I don't know. So, you know, you, flexibility in a very broad sense, I think, is the key, key component. Uh, they both bring up great points. And uh, the only thing I wanted to add to that and also agree with is that not only do you want to demand or command that there be a retail presence that they call it the ground floor of a mixed-use building on El Camino Real, uh, but also uh, being mindful of not imposing unnecessary restrictions and and putting retail in a box uh, like other jurisdictions have. Um, by way of example, in the city of San Francisco, there is a an ordinance called Formula Retail that makes a retailer that has 11 or more units anywhere on the planet Earth. I mean, you could have 10 units in the jungles of Africa <laughs> or the Sahara Desert, wherever, yet you have one in the state of Santa Clara, you want to open number 12 on Union Street in San Francisco, and you have to go get a CUP, a uh, conditional use permit, in order to operate your business. And this is a very real issue. Now, the genesis of that of that uh, form of the retail ordinance was to protect the local mom and pop. So at its at its heart and at its foundation, actually, it's 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 very uh, it comes from a good place. Um, but what has happened is that it's kept a lot of retailers out of the city who actually at the end of the day were actually born in the city of San Francisco and they've grown and spread their wings and now are what they would consider form of the retail when ultimately now they can't actually operate their business or grow their business in the city. Uh, another example would be moratoriums. And we've seen in towns like Los Gatos or wherever, other places where they'll have restaurant moratoriums where you cannot, you can only replace food with food. And now again, I, we, we understand what, what the genesis of those ordinances, but what people don't think through is uh, the, are the ramifications and what's gonna happen 10 years down the line when you know, online retailing is now 8.3% of total retail sales. Well, what happens when it becomes 20%? What happens when it becomes 30%? And really, the only retailers out there, to avoid what Deke was mentioning about dark storefronts, what, what happens then? And, and, and your downtown looks like a movie set. Thank you. So flexibility, flexibility. I do like the town of Los Gatos, and I did live in San Francisco for a long time. So nothing against those cities, just, just for the record. <laughs> So flexibility, got it. Um, so we talked a little bit about retail changing. You you talked a lot about spending time in, in, in getting the right tenant mix that is critical to the heart of the success of a center. Um, but we also talked about a lot of the leases and a lot of the retail is food related. So how has that transformed the way that you actually design shopping centers and spaces. I mean, how does that impact everything else that we have to be thoughtful about, whether it's, you talked a little bit about parking, about walking, about garbage, about deliveries. So let's talk a little bit about those dynamics um, as we think about what happens in those spaces and what are the things that we, kind of like back of the house stuff that we need to be thoughtful about from the beginning and from the front. Oh, gee, thank you. That's a tough one. Is you really you you you? I know it wasn't. That's it's, you fooled me. Um, I, I I think what you're getting at is that food and beverage, to some degree retail, but food and beverage has a set of requirements that are hard to fulfill in neighborhood type settings. 
right? Because you've got deliveries, you've got parking, you've got noise, you've got trash, you've got all kinds of things going on that neighbors, uh, you know, don't like, right? I don't know. I mean, honestly, I don't have that answer. With the work that we primarily do, uh, which is done from scratch, we spend a lot of time trying to figure that out and make it work so that it doesn't become a burden uh, to our uh, residents and, and office tenants. Uh, you have to be incredibly thoughtful about how it works, especially in what I would call confined environments, which is what you're, I think, trying to think through as it relates to development on Camino Real. You know, um, it, it just requires an incredible amount of planning at a very detailed level, and I'm sorry I don't have a simple answer. Deke does, though. <laughs> Uh, well, this is something we, we, we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis as we, as you can see, we're working five, six, seven years in the future at any given day. And a lot of it is crystal balling, but ultimately, when we call it, we plan to merchandise a shopping center and we have a site plan and we're working and trying to understand who should go where and, and more importantly, why. Um, you have to understand that, you know, you're not going to put Gucci uh, next to Tesla next to Crate and Barrel at every shopping center. It's just not going to happen nor do you really want it to happen. And I love Deke's reference earlier when he was speaking as it relates that you want it to fit. Some may argue if I wear suits that are too tight for me, but that's just what I do. It fits me. So, <laughs> but the point being is that it's like clothes. You, when you wear clothes, you wear them for certain events. You wear a suit when you're speaking in front of an audience. You may wear shorts and a t-shirt on a weekend. You go to the beach, you're not gonna wear this. You're gonna wear flip-flops and a tank top, or maybe you don't want to wear one at all. But the, the point is, is that you want to find and really try to harness that true identity of this shopping center, wherever you are, or this shopping center environment. And each has their own. And it could literally be right next door to, for lack of a better reference, call it a Santana Row. And it may not be a Santana Row, nor should it be a Santana Row. And so I think that is the constant challenge in this ever-changing world that we try to capture it, at least for that moment in time, and then be able to work with the cities with their flexibility as time changes and the retail world changes and and change accordingly with it. Wow, I didn't want to go with the clothing analogy after sitting next to you. Is uh, <laughs> I guess um, I can give it a little bit more of a, of a <clears throat> small center perspective. Years ago, we'd always build our storefronts, put five cars per thousand right at the curb, put the trash in the back. And I think that's where you were kind of going a little bit. In the centers now, in which food and beverage really is a, an anchor, there really is what every day you're going to get up and you're going to probably not eat burger every day, right? You're going to go Mexican food one day, you're going to go sushi the next day. So for a shopping center owner, that really what brings you back. I mean, you may not need to go to Target every day, but you're probably going to have lunch, breakfast, and you're probably going to vary it a little bit. And when somebody comes to town, you know, I have an Italian wife, and she'll ask you if you're hungry before, how are you feeling? You know, that's just, you know, how, how it works in our family. And I think that's a little bit how these centers perform. How are you feeling? Are you hungry? And so for us, um, the business has changed. It's changed from that very suburban model in which car was absolutely king in Santa Clara County. We're still in Santa Clara County, and the car is still very important. But if you take our Bass Pro Center, for example, in which we built large regional draw in Bass Pro, look at the food component. It's off to the side. It's actually fairly lightly parked. It's not under parked in total. It's just appropriately parked one or two or 3,000 right by them because we feel that people who come to Bass Pro can walk an eighth of a mile or walk, you know, two storefronts over to get to that cluster. So as you build new on, on El Camino Real, I think you have the ability to isolate these food and beverage areas and entertainment. Um, for us, if you look at our trash enclosures now, you know, both by code and, and for practicality, they actually look like small buildings, and they are. So you think that out up front, we isolate it. I have not figured out 
why the glad bag always leaks, but somehow that guy leaves the ice cream parlor or the Starbucks or the Panera, and somehow it always drizzles yesterday's lunch on that sidewalk, but we haven't been able to solve for that yet exactly, but you can plan for the trash enclosures. I think um, James used an example of town and country. Pretty interesting shopping center, right? You got, you got uh, uh, Stanford Mall right across the street. You look at the mix. They just put Parada up on the point. There's probably barely two per thousand parking in the first thousand feet from that, you know, from that shopping center. Now, I'm not telling you to go out and build a shopping center at, at two per thousand, but you don't need necessarily five per thousand or 10 per thousand for everything. At some point, people will get in the car and go with each other. And I just kept, my other panel was all about transportation and they were kind of getting down on this guy from the MTC about capacity on our freeways. We have the same ridership on Caltrain in 1975 is really due today as a percentage of the population. If you want to knock 50% of the cars off our highways, put a second person in the seat next to them. Now, I drive alone, so I'm not saying that that's going to happen. But you want to add capacity without one more dollar in tax? We can start to change our models a little bit. So shopping centers too. You can change these models. You can cluster the, the, the food and entertainment. People can walk a little bit, people can carpool a little bit, and then you can manage around sort of the, the back of house that goes with that. Right, thank you. Well, you know, we the, the panel is about placemaking and retail and this role of retail in placemaking, right? So, so those back of the house activities and the parking and how we interact with the street are so important. And we make decisions on where we're gonna go and spend our dollar based on how we feel right, the, the outfit and, and what you're looking for. My husband says, where do you want to go for dinner? What do you want to eat tonight? He, that's what he, his question this week was. What do you want to eat tonight? And I said, well, I want to eat outdoors. I want a comfortable chair outdoors. No, what do you want to eat? Well, and, and that's what I'm looking for, right, is that experience that everybody's chasing. So as city folks, city planners, and in our job, and trying to create that sense of place and, and create this connectivity and this fabric. I mean, you, it's easier when you're master planning an entire project that you're in charge of, but from a city perspective, we're working with private entities and developers, and they're all piecemeal, right? And we're trying to create this, this fabric that creates place making along in one piece at a time. So. I'm going to push a little bit more back on, on trying to, to get some good advice for our friends in Santa Clara here. So trying to, to get yourselves in, 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 in um, I don't know, if you were community development director for a day in Santa Clara or city council member, I don't know. Let's think about how would you treat El Camino Real. So this is one of our questions uh, that we have. Um, the, the general plan already has expectations on the amount of retail that should be built along Santa Clara as, as they're looking at redeveloping what's existing into more mixed use, higher density. And, and the city provides some flexibility on a case by case basis, right? And I think that right now they have a minimum commercial FAR of 0.15. But at the end, they continue to struggle on well, and we all do, all cities do, right? And with all the developers, what is the right amount of retail? And how do we get that right? And, and in particular, I see San, uh, El Camino already has this really nice fabric that is already existing. It's not like they're starting from, from scratch, right? So there is an identity to the street. There is, a, there is a fabric with the community. So how do we go forward and how can the city of Santa Clara succeed as they plan for the future of El Camino? <laughs> I know. I, I guess. And then after this, I promise this is the last questions. We'll open it up for Q and A from the community, so we can get you home at some time. By eleven. <laughs> um, yeah, it's uh, with no vote tonight, though. Uh, I guess so. You, you actually answered your own question. I mean, when you have fractionalized ownership. The beauty is you are going to get this quilt 
that over time will stitch together, that will make up that street scene. It's very hard to say something absolute. Everybody should be set back 20 feet from the face of the curb, because you want to make sure you have enough depth there to allow a normal crosswalk, or excuse me, a normal sidewalk to function, but you have enough leftover area so people can activate their storefronts and have outdoor dining. And that would be a, that's a very great thing to say. We want to promote that we get people out on the curb. We want to drive by. We want to see families. Remember that by ABC laws, you got to have a, have a hard rail. So if you want to have a, a beer, you're inside that hard rail. Well, if my property is 150 feet deep. That's a totally reasonable requirement. But if James's property is only 30 feet deep, how would he be able to meet that and have a, a uh, the ability to have a, a viable site? So I think you can have design criteria that allows you the flexibility, from my standpoint, that promotes um, broader sidewalks. You don't want them too deep because then you can't see what's going on. You want storefronts that are tall enough that you can see light and activity into it. You know, we all used to build, you know, eight foot tall doors in this high of a storefront. And you never knew if the guy was open because by the time somebody stood up, you couldn't see if the lights are on. So to me, you want to have as much glass as possible. You want to have a depth of sidewalk that is uh, accommodating if that tenant wants to have outdoor dining. Um, you'll get a group that really wants to promote street trees, and that's great. But those trees do grow up. And if it's a type of tree that blocks that storefront, then that traditional retailer won't be able to succeed. So. It's not one size fits all, but I think you can have priorities and clearly applicants who come along who have read those priorities and to the extent that they can have tried to achieve those priorities, I think would um, have a favorable reception at the planning desk versus someone who wants to turn the back of their building, do nothing and, you know, and run it out to a tenant that you don't find to be very savory, like James Taylor. Oh, that's a person, <laughs> sorry. I guess, you know, my thoughts are focused on city energy, city effort to make new things happen. Uh, and I think there'd be a real uh, natural tendency in Santa Clara to, given the length and breadth of El Camino, to spread that energy and focus very broadly. Um, I don't know, that might be the right thing to do. But I tend, personally, I tend to think more that that energy and, and focus ought to be directed to nodes of development, key locations, key intersections, key spots where enough property can be assembled. Unfortunately, we don't have redevelopment. Some, some people think it's a great thing. Some people think it's a bad thing. It certainly had its place. We don't have that, so, uh, but I do think that the cities uh, are going to have to start to function more aggressively in that regard to uh, help create uh, those nodes uh, and to really focus those energies for the community uh, on those nodes where destinations can be successful. If you spread it out too much, you're just going to, you're going to, People, you know, they're just not going to, you, you're creating a lot of enemies. Uh, and I'm not sure how successful you're going to be with that. Yeah, I think the, uh, the landscape of ownerships along El Camino is as diverse as its community. And to, to Deke's point, to have a so one solution for everybody wouldn't work. And, and a great example, just going back to, again, Retail Fundamentals 101, um, retailers need accessibility. So for example, if you have a parcel that's mid-block and the only way to get there is you have to go up a quarter mile to do a U-turn and come back that quarter mile right into the property and only be able to ride out of the property, well, you know, while discussing here tonight, you may think, oh, it's not that big a deal. Well, guess what? That's the difference between you going there versus the guy that's sitting on the fully signalized intersection that may have a lesser product, a lesser quality of product, but you're going there because it's convenient. It's easier. 
you have two screaming kids in the back of the car. There's a drive through And you know what? It's like, I just need to get in and get out. I can't deal with sitting at the light, making a U-turn. And so it's those types of things that aren't really thought through to their fullest um, that ultimately need to, again, going back to what Steve was saying with regards to maybe having those nodes and areas of focus, but really, more importantly, having fairly wide guardrails. Thank you. Um, this is really good information for us in the city of Morgan Hill as well. We have our version of El Camino with Monterey Corridor, and we are actually doing this uh, exercise right now where we are taking away the retail requirement from just across the entire corridor and only focusing it on very specific nodes where you have the accessibility that, that retailers need. So with that, we're going to um, move on to Q&A. Is that okay? And Andrew is going to pass uh, the microphone. So you need to speak to the mic because this is being televised. Um, and with that, who wants to go first? I'll just work my way back. Hi there. Um, El Camino has a whole bunch of problems. Number one, I think it's pretty ugly. And because Santa Clara doesn't own it, how, what kind of suggestions do you have to make it into a destination so that people will come to it and retailers will want to rent it? And right now we have a tremendous shortage of simple things like grocery stores. So what could Santa Clara recommend strongly slash require to have retailers come in like grocery stores to make it look better and to have that type of a, an appeal to get the customers there and the retailers to come and stay? Sure. Um, I think it takes projects like Steve's in the community or like Deeks and Sunnyvale to make that happen. Unfortunately, there, it requires a certain critical mass and a certain ge it's geography. Uh, but at the end of the day, along El Camino, how it's organically and naturally evolved is that there's been a need for daily needs, which again, are these grocery stores and ethnic ones at that. I mean, between what, San Tomas and Lawrence is unofficially Koreatown, right? I'm Korean, so. I, I do spend time there, but uh, <laughs> not all my time. But uh, nevertheless, um, it, and unfortunately, there, it, to be able to create, I think, what you're looking for, uh, you definitely need to have a larger uh, piece of land or the, have the opportunity to assemble more land at a, at a good intersection in order to be able to potentially create what you want. But I think what they're doing, they're doing the Taj Mahal uh, in, within the city limits. So, um, so I had uh, just two, one comment and one question. So the uh, the garbage question. Um, I don't know if we do enough as a community or society on how we think about trash, like they do in Europe, where they have no space, and out here we're kind of spoiled. So whether it's composting, the various recycling models that I think San Francisco has tried to embrace, we're starting to do it a little bit here. How can, especially the new projects that are coming online with, in Sunnyvale and the city place, how can you Im Im embed the, the whole notion of that reusable world that we need to be in rather than a disposable one? That was my, that's, my, that's a comment, uh, semi-question. Um, but the other one is, uh, is addressed to you about rents. Um, a lot of these new buildings and a new, uh, are really expensive. Um, triple net costs are incredibly high because of the high cost of value of the properties. So you may have a rent of three, four bucks a month, but you might have eight dollars a month in triple net or, or for insurances and the rest of it. How how can you keep your smaller retailers? I have a small retail uh, business. I cannot afford to move into, for example, City Place. There's just I, I can't. I, I, I don't, maybe, I don't know. Uh, I, but in, in general, the, the new buildings that are like when they built um, River, Rivermark, was, is, 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 the, the level was a lot higher than it was before. I'm not saying it shouldn't be done because we need the spaces, we need to redevelop things, but how can you create that fabric of the, the neighborhood community retailers and restaurants to uh, rather than just be Applebee's or Panera or uh, The Habit? 
Well, I guess, I mean, I'll take a swing at it for James. Uh, on the microphone. Is, uh, you know, rents are a function of sales. So there, on, on one hand, if, if we can have a successful shopping center and generate sales, then the rents will follow. So we, we look very closely at cost of occupancy on behalf of our tenants. It does, does no good whatsoever to have, put a tenant in business and impose a high rent and high triple nets. Um, just to have them fail. It's the worst thing we can do. We get a bad reputation doing that. So in that regard, <clears throat> it's, it's a very tough proposition if you're looking at tenants that are not going to be high volume tenants, which would hear me out. The way you can bring these fixed costs down, <clears throat> the rents down, is through density, right? So, um, and I know I'm, I'm harping on that and, and I have no ax to bear. So, but those densities will allow us to transfer more of the land costs, more of the permit fees, more of these priorities as it comes to um, recycling and dealing with refuge. Um, the more of those costs that we can amortize out across the project, the more flexible we are to take a broader range of tenants from in range as in size and in volumes. So it's, um, you need to move those costs off. You know, I, I, by a simple example, I had a tenant out at our Coleman project over there by the earthquake stadium we're building. And this tenant could be in my Rebid City office buildings. We've built a, we do a lot of transit oriented development. What's your rent? I said, oh, for here at, at the stadium, those rents are 350. What's the rent in Rebid City? Seven bucks. It's the same building, exactly. It's the exact same building. I mean, it's steel, it's glass, it's you know, class A in every sense. So the market will move, and that's why this tenant wants to be in Santa Clara or San Jose, because they can afford to be there and get the same type of quality. So you know, those assets will move up and down, but to the extent that you can move costs off will allow you to be more flexible to have a broader range of tenants of both national and local. Got a question uh, for you. I, everything was very informative. Uh, I seem to agree with you regarding the new development we're going to be building in the landfill that we have. The only disagreement I have is we should build more hotels in there because we already have a nucleus with our convention center, the stadium, a lot of corporate offices are going to be around the area, and you yourself said that we, there's going to be a lot of headquarters coming in there. So what we need is also more hotels, especially in, down in uh, towards First Street in San Jose. As you know, they're developing that area too, so we can take the the revenues that they're in, into our hotels from those uh, businesses. As it is right now, you probably know this since you folks travel. As when I have uh, vendors coming over to our area from different parts of the country, they can't find hotel rooms in here. They have to go out of the area towards Gilroy or completely way out there. So this is nuts. That's right. There's no place out of here for hotels. One of the things to parking, even though you're saying you're going to have parking the outside, I think we're going to need more parking there because don't forget we have the stadium. We have also the convention center if you want to attract more businesses. And guess what? Like the old saying that they used to tear down a building, put a parking lot. Now it's reverse. The, take down a parking lot and put up a building. Look at what's happening in downtown San Jose. It's the reverse as it used to be in, in the old days, especially since one of the things that you mentioned is you want to attract, if you have a nucleus of the store in the shopping center, you said you want to attract businesses from 20 to 30 miles out too. So if people are going to be uh, driving over to uh, you know, uh, do business, they'll need a place to park. Right now, Valley Fair, with the construction that they have, a lot of the businesses are, are losing sales in there. The reason is people just get fed up, they can't find a parking place, and they just leave. And let's try to get away from a lot of restaurants. We need more uh, retail businesses, because that's what brings the, a lot more tax revenue than restaurants. Restaurants one of the most riskiest businesses that, that you can open in any type of businesses. So. Can't just make that happen either, right? Exactly. Exactly. But one of the things that oh, excuse me. One of the things that you mentioned that when you were talking, 
that we have the same uh, problem here, and I think we're going to find a solution in our city here, is in downtown Sunnyvale, what you're doing, the development is that you want to bring the community together, people to come in and talk to each other, so, uh, each other and so on. That is what we're going to try to do here in the downtown of uh, Santa Clara, or that we used to have a downtown. That's what a couple of steady groups that they have, that's where they're talking about. And uh, I, I probably, you know, since you've been involved in Los Angeles quite a bit, Rick Caruso, you probably know him, the developer. About, yeah, about 13 years ago, I talked to him, and I, right where we were developing our landfill, I said, you know, Santa Clara has a lot of potential to do that. And we talked about that, and it's one of the things, but the Grove is the example that I would like to see, like in our downtown Santa Clara. That's a walking retail and a lot of city together. Thank you. Okay, um, so uh, this would apply to just the El Camino corridor here in, in Santa Clara, but also other other areas where you where you're starting to build a, a vibrant restaurant scene. You've got your social scene, but your your retail is lagging. So, what type of businesses do you look for to be the catalyst for developing more retail when you're looking at at revitalizing an area? What are the what are the key types of businesses that tend to stand out? Any of you? So this is very, that question actually is very, I would love more direction um, as it relates to, are we talking more street front retail, shopping center retail, street front, street front. Well, if you're a great uh, place to start when thinking about that, you can look at other communities, even better yet at successful or what in your mind are other successful communities around the barrier, whether that's San Carlos, Burlingame, Walnut Creek, uh, downtown Pleasanton, who knows? But most of those, again, a true uh, downtown, call it, is typically uh, many separate ownerships, right? Very rarely do you have one like a downtown Pleasant Hill was, was somewhat artificial uh, because it was one developer built it but called it downtown. Uh, the challenge with that, and I think where Deke was about to go, was that the, you cannot create retail because you want it. And as we know where the world is going, it's, it's potentially, it could get worse as it relates to less retailers wanting to open storefronts. Now, having said that, it could also evolve. So the, the glass being half full, maybe it becomes more of a showcasing environment, like Bonobos at Santana Row, where you walk in and you go and shop for your clothes, they measure you up, and then you walk out with nothing in your hand. It's being shipped to your house. There's no back of the house. There's nowhere they're keeping. They're keeping zero inventory, and but they need a storefront. They want you to experience the interface with their brand ambassadors. So maybe there's something like that. But what ends up happening in those in those more traditional street front environments is that you get not only more maybe some more regional and local tenants, uh, but also maybe you sprinkle in the national guys too. But really, it ultimately comes down to a lot of the fundamentals we were talking about earlier. So there's not a Unfortunately, oh, a, a single answer to your your question. Absolutely. So an art gallery would require, so for example, if Deke was buying a building and he's paying X amount, obviously he needs to underwrite a certain return and otherwise it makes no sense. He's not going to buy something to lose money. That makes no sense. Also, the art gallery operator needs to somehow fund, fund their business. And usually what that's called is a health ratio. And going back to the restaurant example, that health ratio is usually about 10%. So gross sales to occupancy. And so when they're looking at that number, is Deke's number that he needs the rent to be paid in order to make, call it, let's say, his 10% return, equivalent to her health ratio and her occupancy costs and what she can pay in rent? And do those match? And you know, it's a, it's a hard marriage to find, right? If you think about it, because people are constantly buying and selling buildings and different businesses maybe like yours, you know, can afford to pay different things. Cause like a grocery, for example, their health, health ratio is like two to 3%. So each business and is, is so unique to its own that to be able to match that up perfectly to the retail space is, is the challenge. Uh, James, I would just add, it, it's really interesting the situation we're in today with retail. I've said it before, Deke has, James. It's so interesting that, and 
we're an unusual company. We're the largest privately held real estate owner in the United States. And we are now funding a venture to begin to incubate the next generation of retail because we're not sure we're going to find it completely in traditional, the hands of traditional merchants and t traditional tenants. And we're making a very large investment uh, in that process. Um, and, you know, we're quite confident that we'll be successful at it. But, you know, th that should tell you something about how challenging the next few years is, is going to be. Um, so on one hand, I'm, I'm telling you, you just can't make it happen if it, if it doesn't want to be there. Now, there's a flip side to that, so I'm going to contradict myself a little bit. I'll give you two examples. <clears throat> In Santa Barbara, just uh, south of State Street, an older industrial area, a creative guy came in there and with... He had opened up a couple of brew pubs and a distillery. I know that's on the alcohol side. But then he worked with a lot of the local wineries, and they opened up storefronts that really uh, promoted these local wineries. And so instead of driving up to San Inez, which is the nearest area to Santa Barbara where you might go you know, on, on a wine tour or up to Napa, he created this own little environment in these industrial buildings. They had a little kind of patina and a little, they were kind of hip and cool, and you could sit outside and get a sandwich. And it, and it created his own, you know, um, his own retail environment where there otherwise was none, right? It wasn't a place where any other normal retailer could go. And there's a, another project. Now, Don Brand happens to own this other project, so he's not financially uh, restricted. They opened up, a, I'm going to only get this half right, so don't, don't correct me if I'm more than half wrong. But they opened up a mall that was competing with, an, or they opened up a retail piece that was competing with other projects. So they had this great idea. They went out and got every boutique shoe vendor they could, everyone they could find, and gave them free rent or just triple net charges. And it created its own driver to this site. So when you talked about having an art gallery, you know, at first I was thinking, ah, oh, one-off art gallery doesn't get it done. But if, if you made it a community focal point that you were gonna go pursue all these different art galleries and have your own art scene, you would have something that Valley Fair doesn't have or what we're having or what Valco 2.0 is going to have. You would have, you could make your own space in pursuing less than traditional retail, but you're gonna to have to probably, I hate to say it, give it away to get it to get it going. But you could think outside the box and go, Santa Clara, we have an agrarian background. We're gonna have, I'm making this up, pop-up food and pop-up, you know, farmer's market. That's not new enough, but maybe there's an idea with that with a series of art galleries that makes you your own little, you know, Carmel by the El Camino. You mentioned um, for the related projects, the um, parking places, par uh, parking is um, placed on the um, periphery of the project because the uh, parking needs may change in the future. And um, I think maybe you're referring to the coming of autonomous driving and that's, that's um, it, it may change the parking requirements. So um, if that happens, then it's going to affect every retail uh, uh, buildings in um, all over the world. So, as the developers, what do you think? Uh, what are the, some of the things that you think you could do with the, you know, the space that you no longer need for parking? And and you know, this is valuable uh, real estate, so you probably want to make good use of it, right? Well, uh, two things. Uh, if you've built a parking garage and you no longer need the the parking spaces because the, the you know travel habits have changed dramatically autonomous vehicles or something else we're actually designing our garages so that the, the spaces particularly at the lower levels can be converted to different uses and possibly even the upper levels <clears throat> to some degree so we're thinking ahead <clears throat> uh, that puts that increases 
your first cost a little bit because you can't build the cheapest garage imaginable with eight foot ceilings. You've got to build them taller for eventual reuse. So that's one thing you know that we're we're doing. Uh, the other is <clears throat> we're going to be with our city place project. We're going to be very very careful with the phasing of parking. Uh, you know, City Place will be built over 10 to 20 years. And so we're going to watch that evolution very, very carefully. And we're going to, we, we're going to try very hard not to get way out ahead of the parking demand, the real demand. And of course, you know, we will be working very closely with the city to make sure that we, and we've built in to uh, our planning documents, the ability to have that type of flexibility with regard to parking ratios for uses. A question for you, this is a scenario question, and you can picture anywhere in Santa Clara County and you have the opportunity to buy a four acre shopping center that the city wants you to do mixed use on. And starting with Deke, if you're entitled for 30 units to the acre, versus 60 units to the acre versus 90 units to the acre. In each of those three scenarios, what more could you provide or would there be no difference at all? All right, so first of all, four acres is a terrible size. It's one of those sizes that you can't build enough critical mass to have a super viable shopping center. So if you think about Whole Foods at 50,000 feet, um, Whole Foods alone would take over four acres just to support them. So, but I understand your question. The question is, what's the right density? The, if I had a certain size shopping center to me and, and, I, and all my residential was going to be a bonus on top of it, and um, I think the simple answer today I would say is probably 60 units to the acre. And the reason why I say that is, as you grade through the different types of construction, type five, type three, type one, type one being concrete construction, that really needs to be a high rise. It really needs to be 10 stories to make that cost work out. Type three can be a combination. Type five is a typical kind of 30 units to the acre. So. You need to have a means and method of construction that would support it. So 60 units to the acre would allow you to have some tuck under retail um, to complement it. So my answer would be 60. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that, I mean, when I look at a picture like the one behind behind you guys, or it's, not, I mean, not even to hammer so much on that specific development, but one of the things that I see here in the Bay Area, because we can't really expand sideways, right? And a lot of times we have to go up. And I see one of the biggest missed opportunities in a lot of these big developments that are either um, retail or commercial or corporate, like office space, which doesn't really apply so much in residential, is the lack of use of the rooftops. And, um, and you know, when you look at, you know, a place like San Francisco or even in a lot of other, you know, uh, metropolitan cities, you'll find rooftop terraces, rooftop restaurants. Um, you know, a great example locally is uh, one of Facebook's new buildings where they have an, I think it's, it's a massive, you know, greenfield, you know, park on the rooftop. And if you look at it from the satellite view, view in Google Maps, you'd think it was a park, but it's an, an entire, you know, corporate office building. And so when I look at, you know, developments like that, I see a huge missed opportunity where all of that square footage could be usable space. And so I wanted to ask you guys as, you know, um, the developers is, is why haven't we been seeing more of this given that we don't, we don't have enough room to expand, you know, sideways, um, especially whether there's green spaces or just more rooftop terraces, restaurants, that sort of a thing. Um, is it, you know, what are the, what are the kind of the barriers that, you are seeing in terms of doing that? Or is that something that you guys are considering moving forward, you know, knowing that there is more limited space and that is a missed opportunity that you guys are gonna start, you know, integrating more into your designs? What are your thoughts on that? Um, this is actually a really good example. So this is mixed use 1.0. And you know, so you're right, I, I think as the new owner of this, 
you know, we're evolving exactly in, in parallel to what you're suggesting, that these are missed opportunities. And so the, the challenge for the community and the challenge for politicians and the challenge for the developers or to try and get beyond you know, themselves and try to look further down the road. I'm sure when this project was approved, everybody thought it was cutting edge. And here we are just 10 years later going, really? You don't even have solar panels on your roof. Really? We're not putting senior housing on that roof. You know, why aren't we putting these things together? So I think the reason why these opportunities were missed in previous generations was the fear of the impacts, the related impacts, more people, more demands on city services. And so they tend to get mired down and compromised and you get uh, lower density executions. Clearly going forward, I would advocate, even on this project behind us, is to put all those roofs to work. And, you know, it's a sh you know, it's a shame that, you know, there aren't even solar panels. So I'm, I'm just picking on that one because I, how, isn't it? It's amazing, actually. So, um, and the hard part is, and Steve touched upon it, the garages and, and these older projects, we would park on the ramps. And so when we don't need five per thousand parking anymore, and we need two per thousand, these older garages really are almost impossible to retrofit. New garages, like they're talking about at City Place or garages that we're thinking about, no longer are eight feet on the ground floor. They're only 15 feet on the ground floor and they're dead flat, so we can put them to work as maker space or other spaces and, and try and take that whole building. So you're right, this is an opportunity in new projects to put all of it to work. Not everybody can build a rooftop garden like Facebook, maybe the related companies can, um, but there are opportunities that definitely from a, a solar farm to other activities to make these whole buildings you know, active. We, we, with City Place, we definitely see it as a great opportunity. Uh, and we're, we've done a lot of brainstorming, actually, on how to, how to use uh, rooftops for outdoor space, for gardens, for market-driven, uh, related to restaurants. Um, we've, we've even thought about uh, uh, old-style cinema uh, on a rooftop. Uh, kind of cool. Uh, so we're definitely in uh, in the frame of mind that there is tremendous uh, it's tremendous missed opportunity. I think it's a generational thing to some degree. Uh, I think it also reflects on the value, the cost of land. You know, we got to utilize every square inch because it's costing you dearly. You know, for that, uh, and also for in our case, we'll be using significant amount of rooftops for solar application. De definitely, that's extremely important for sustainability. Is some of that cost prohibitive or not, or not really the value that you get out of it? Is what? The, uh, the garden, outdoor like greening? Or no, it, it's actually not, it's not a cost factor. The, the challenge is getting people to go up. You know, it's really hard getting people to go above one or two levels. You know, we're all challenged by that with the projects that we do. Um, I've been involved in projects, fortunately, very successfully, like Water Tower Place in Chicago, Copley Place in Boston, and San Francisco Center on Market Street, where we were able to program uses on the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, even seventh floors of these buildings. But boy, I'm telling you, it's it's a big, big challenge. So it's hard to get people to think about actually going up. So you got to make it very attractive, got to make it easy, and, and you got to make it really cool to go up there. All right, I'm going to try to take two more questions that I saw here. I know it's getting a little bit late, and these guys have been volunteering their time. I really appreciate them. I think they, they're enjoying what they're talking about, but let's try to wrap it up a little bit. Hi. Um, I love dining out, and I'm excited at the prospect of sidewalk dining at, uh, at City Place. If there is sidewalk dining in Santa Clara, I can't think of it. Um, and dare I dream Creekside Dining? I mean, you've got that beautiful creek running there. That would just be amazing. Um, I'm having dinner with my family tomorrow. I 
am not going to drive across the valley to pick up my brother and then down the valley to pick up my mom. We're going to meet at the restaurant. So that's kind of upside down of the you must carpool logic that that goes with the we're not going to build many parking lot parking spaces because of someday in the future something will happen. Um, it's it's it doesn't make sense to carpool to the mall. It makes sense if it's a destination to let's meet at the mall and then we'll have fun there and then we'll go back to our own homes. Um, likewise, if there's public, if you say public transportation, if I buy something at the mall, I want to throw it in my car. I don't want to haul a bunch of bags on uh, a bus or the light rail and make transfer and transfer and eventually get either to my home or car. Um, Thank you. Uh, yes, I have a very, very small question. Uh, first, I want to give some love to um, City Line Beta. That's my favorite target. So much parking. Days that I make all my Fitbit steps, go into that target. Um, but so my question is, when you're redeveloping City Line or you're making City Line, what kind of elements are you going to use to connect City Line to historical Murphy Street? It's a good question. Um, and I don't have all those forward looking graphics here, but for us, the way we're going to connect it to Murphy Street is, um, I'm looking up at the picture behind me, but if you actually you can stay with that before, but um, yeah, that actually will work well enough. So basically, we're opening up our park, and then we're creating a lineal park that goes along Murphy back towards historic Murphy. So instead of trying to compete with historic Murphy, we're trying to create an outside component that kind of bridges the pedestrian experience from the existing historic Murphy down toward the, we haven't even built Murphy Street yet, but down toward where our future park will be. So it's, um, it's an opportunity for us to really use the outdoor spaces um, and not for a built environment, but for an unbuilt environment, for an environment that kind of reflects events, civic activities, or pop-up food opportunities. So um, it'll be an open environment as you go down Murphy Street. Wait, 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 wait. It seems that a lot of the success of these planned community developments relies on the fact that people can go there as an excursion, as a day out. There's a lot of, you talk about parks and that you built it around the trees and the park. You even commented coming in here, there were families out enjoying the park setting. So as the city of Santa Clara grows and develops and creates these multi-unit buildings, how much priority should be given to allowing families and people living in those type of situations opportunities to just connect along the El Camino and in the other areas of the city where we're going to have these work live spaces but people may not necessarily want to go spend money but they want to connect and how much priority do you think should be given to that because it seems like all of these devel developments have that as part of the plan if i if i understand your question correctly by priority do you mean like um it should be part of the plan in the okay. parking lots or not not preference one group over the other or something no i'm, I'm just th wondering does the retail depend on people wanting to just meander through and then find their way into a store as opposed to getting into the car going there right the car is still king so if i if i didn't describe it correctly i think what the three of us are trying to say is the character of the car is going to change over time and we're trying to create a built environment that can respond to that. But the car is still king, so we're not asking anybody to haul the furniture from West Elm onto the train. As it relates to the park, for for my project, and this can be different in a more of a built environment, I think, for City Place, but maybe we'll use Santana Row as a live example today. 
what we would all kind of joke about 20 years ago, look like the median of the road, really becomes, has become kind of this active area. It's very dynamic. So people, in, in, in some regard, if you look at Santana Row, there aren't that many shopping bags. And more people have gone out there to be in that dynamic environment, seen, be seen, have their kids ride around on their scooters and, and, um, and create that family connection. And that was to my earlier point, that some of your basic needs shopping are getting, you know, we all walk around now with a phone that's a computer that's, you know, has a drone probably tethered to it. Um, but what the internet is not, it's not you and your family and it'll never be that. The internet is the opportunity of everything, but socially it's the opportunity of nothing. And that's really, I think for us, our shopping centers are going towards in which they're more living centers. They're not lifestyle because that defines a certain type of tenant. It's truly the makeup and the character of the people who may have a similar shared um, preference for that location and how they interact and then how you support that body of people. And that might be big retail, like, like you know what City Place should be. It could be very small retail. It could just be a little corner building that is a bucolic setting. And so I don't think there's one formula. There are basic axioms you don't want to violate. For us, we have this park. So the previous guy, and he was a really smart guy, actually, was kind of horseshoeing it in. For us, we think it's a way to sort of give the community immediately around us an opportunity to stretch it, stretch it all the way down to Old Murphy Street. So there's not a set formula. But for us, I view our park the equivalent of having, uh, you know, trying to think of a powerhouse, Neiman Marcus, in, in my shopping center. <laughs> so I don't know if that answers your question. You know, it, to us, our park is a gathering point, and we've spent a lot of time programming that park, how light, outdoor music works. We actually have a way to, to um, exhibit you know, uh, film up on the side of one of the buildings, and we negotiated that with the theater tenant. So a lot of programming goes into that park to make it really worthwhile for farmer's market, to tree lighting ceremonies, to just the summer series for jazz. So for me, that was important in this location. I may have a different opinion of what I did out at Bass Pro. So, we're going to have one very last, absolutely last question. Um, Under the wire. <laughs> Under the wire. So Go. I want to uh, piggyback on a couple of the questions that were raised earlier and your answer, Deke, when you said four acres is too small, but 60 dwelling units an acre might give you the flexibility to do mixed use, I believe was the, the point. I want to dig into that a little bit. Uh, saying historically, we know that cities have pushed and pushed to do mixed use with retail under residential, especially in places like El Camino Real. And then we've also realized that that was too strict a request and that it was largely infeasible for most developers on most sites to do that kind of development. So if we go back to your question about four acres and 60 units per acre, can you give us some idea of what other thresholds exist around that question? And I'm thinking particularly then about the size of acreage of course, there are a lot of other ramifications that fit into that. But how do cities begin to grapple with getting sites large enough to really do mixed use in the way that, uh, in a way that makes sense? For certainly not always along the huge examples that we're talking about in Santa Clara, but in from a standpoint in many cities and the kinds of streets where we're trying to build this interaction of uses. Then let me say there's a part B to that question, which is, Steve, you said that uh, the hard part about putting activities on rooftops was getting people up there, but we've also been cautious about trying to divert any kind of pedestrian activity to another level because we were working so hard to get it at the street level. So I wanted to get a sense of how, what do you watch for before you even try to put an activity on the roof and divert part of your population to the roof? 
So I, um, I'm glad you followed up because I was afraid that answer was going to dog me. Um, you know, when you ask me the static environment, what do I think about four acres and what I can put on top of it? That's a no-win question, right? Because you're trying to, and that was kind of our point early on, to formulaically, and that's even a word, it's like strategically, to, to, to set a hard, fast formula in which you have a four-acre site, you're going to build 60 units to the acre, and you're going to do tuck under retail, is, a, um, I think, a recipe for failure. Because at this moment in time, Maybe that guy wants to, if, if, if the community and the location is sensitive enough to where it can take a taller building, you're right, it, it could be 90 units to the acre. I might build 90 units to the acre and nothing over the top of the retail, except for a garden. <laughs> and, uh, so, so I'm saying, so you can have mixed uses and think about it as a wedding cake. You can have mixed up uses and you can create these districts along the lines of city place. So I don't think there's one set formula. Creating the flexibility will allow the developer or the owner to push for the best outcome. Um, I was going to give you a really lame example. I have a new project in Menlo Park. I went into the planning department and they said, um, you can't have that driveway there because the maximum setback was 25 feet. And I had a uh, a ramp going underground. So we drew the building back up and we came back and we got rid of the driveway. The planner came back and said, oh, we really like the driveway. He told me I couldn't have the driveway because you have a rule that said I had to have no more setback than this. So my point, long-winded point is, I would be careful about that. I would come up with these ranges and let the market, because in not knowing if there's a great shopping center next door and there are no tenants available or there's nothing nearby, um, I mean, for San Jose, let's take, you know, the intersection of Saratoga and Stevens Creek. If you over ask, you won't get development. And if you make it too restrictive, you can't get enough development to get it off the ground. So it's, there's a lot of, you know, I'm, I, it's very hard, I think, from a planning standpoint, from a community standpoint, to leave it so broad based. So that's, that's the tricky part. That's the magic of, you know, of your job. Uh, just the question about, uh, I think, diffusing the energy of street level by trying to get people. I, I, I agree with that point 100%. I wasn't suggesting that we were going to take restaurants and retail to garage, but we do think there are opportunities for creative open space, gardens, um, I use the cinema, outdoor cinema example. Uh, you're seeing some of the tech companies do that in the use of their outdoor space, not necessarily rooftops. So that's what I was really getting at. But you're absolutely right. You can't, you gotta be very careful not to pull that street level energy away and diffuse it. Well. I want to thank the panel. They have been so generous with their time and the audience that stuck around with us and didn't go home. Uh, and everybody, whomever is watching, uh, I want your help in thanking the panel here and giving them a big round of applause. And once again, thank you, City of Santa Clara, for having this conversation. It's not just for your community. It's for many of us that are paying attention and learning. So everybody, thank you. Good night. Andrew, anything else? Yeah. I'll echo all that uh, without being repetitive. Um, I also appreciate that everyone's here tonight. And I'll just mention that we're back here next Thursday at 630 to talk about housing and placemaking, uh, new neighborhoods, and how that works. Um, and then we have an event the following Thursday at the Santa Clara University talking about uh, urbanizing Silicon Valley and how that fits in as well. So I look forward to seeing uh, all of you at those events too. Thank you all. And we uh, have some uh, cookies for the road, please. <laughs>